Hello, hello everyone. Delightful, delightful to see you all. Welcome. Thank you all for coming. You know, I'm gonna kind of like do my spiel while I wait to see who, who else wants to show up. Um, but uh, today is super fun. Today is natural wine, um, which I think is, you know, it's one of those fun ones that's like, I think, um, I, everyone kind of hears about natural wine. You know, it's thrown around quite a bit. Like we, like we talk about it, it's on wine lists. You know, it's a big buzzword and it's fairly, fairly misunderstood still, I think, um, by a lot of people. Oh, Rachel had thunder. Yes, excellent. I'm so glad to hear that. It really was nice. Um, just sit, like, seriously, one of my very favorite things. So great. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, um, I'm so curious uh, for anyone who decided to to open some wine tonight with me. I'd love to know what everyone decided to get because, like I said, this is a wide ranging category. So there's quite a few options for what people want to be drinking. Um, I went with a producer, uh, an Austrian producer, Meinklang. Uh, so that's these guys right here, and I ended up getting their orange wine. Um, and what uh, I wish that I could actually show this video better for you guys because. One of the great things about this that just is all sorts of, uh, you know, good stuff. There's lovely little crusty tartrates on the bottom of this bottle, right? Uh, a little bit of a cloudiness and a haziness to the wine itself. All of this is the fun kind of stuff that we talk about when we talk about natural wine. Um, but, uh, and also this one, since it's an orange wine, as you can see, i uh, hold it down a little bit there, definitely coming out with a different color. And we'll talk a little bit about orange wine and the role that it plays in uh, natural wine as well. But uh, what else has everyone got? I'm so curious if anyone wants to share or if no one's drinking, I mean, that's totally fine. It is Wednesday after all, I don't wanna. <laughs> Maybe it's too early for some people, I don't know. <laughs> is anyone just drinking straight vodka? Uh, <laughs> That's another class. They make vodka from grapes. We can talk about it sometime if people are interested. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Well, you guys, as you know, I get most of my wines from uh, a cognac session. Yeah, Nick, right? I can. I think that, I mean, I'm, I'm a big spirit fan, not gonna lie. Oh, I have a whole bunch of stuff. So Rachel, John Anthony Sauv Blanc, awesome. Um, Pamela, I'm totally gonna type that in right now for you. Um, and I got this at high time today. So they definitely have plenty of it. And this producer I've used before also in uh, when I did my Germany and Austria class as well. I mean, they're just a very, they're a wonderful, very well-known natural wine producer out of Austria. They make a wide range of products. Um, they have uh, sparkling petillons, you know, the petillons naturals. They've got uh, red wines, white wines. Um, most of what they do is, is technically natural. Um, a lot of it is biodynamically farmed. They're bio and so this all kind of goes together, right? Um, when we're talking about how we can do um, because part of what makes it such a unique category of wine is that it's not really a category. It's quite a broad range of ideas that are very, very explicit while at the same time being unregulated. So it's very interesting. Um, let's see, Sandra is currently drinking a French Chardonnay, was drinking vermouth on the rocks with an orange peel earlier. Of course, delightful, uh, as one should on a Wednesday. Um, Chenin Blanc from Vouvray. Ah, John, of course. Excellent. Um, yeah, everything works. I mean, with these things, you know me, everything works. Anything you want to drink? Perfect. But, uh, you know, we get to talk a little bit about the rest of this too. Awesome. So, um, yep. I mean, without further ado, I'm just going to go ahead and jump into it. We'll let some people get on here whenever they get on here. But I'm going to get my little presentation going for y'all. Woo! And, uh, and talk about natural wine today. And I, I did my own natural. I was really loving that tagline. So you're probably like, yes, Sasha, we get it. Super, super got it. <laughs> what can I say? I'm a, a simple creature right now. <laughs> but you know, I decided to change the tagline for the first slide because I was like, people are probably sick of that. I'm sick of it myself in terms, I'm not really, but you know, trying to keep it. Getting back to the roots, because ultimately when we talk about natural wine, um, one of the main things we're talking about really is this process that is not in any way new, <laughs> which is kind of the most fun about it. Um, ah, Shannon is drinking Chevalier Muscadet. Oh, Muscadet, what a beautiful, beautiful grape and wine. Um, enjoy, please. Uh, easily amused is highly underrated. <laughs> Thank you. I, I appreciate that. I think, I think, I think <laughs> it sounds like a good thing. <laughs> 
So um, there's a few different things about natural wine though. Jess is kind of a broad ranging entry. Let's just talk about the beginning of all of this. You know, when we're talking about natural wine, we are technically talking about several things. One of the first things we're talking about is a process. The process of making wine in a natural way. Now, as we can imagine, as this exactly as it sounds, this is again, a very, very sort of broad spectrum of what does that mean? And that's a little bit about what we are going to talk about today. Um, next, of course, uh, natural wine is also, in addition to a process, it is also a philosophy. So this is where it starts to get a little bit more close to home for a lot of people, a little bit more straight to the heart. It, it really encompasses not just, of course, the process of the winemaking itself. It also includes the process of growing the grapes. It includes sort of a mental philosophy towards winemaking, but also kind of towards lifestyle choices. Uh, and this is where it kind of moves into a very, very, uh, especially in the 21st century where it's gained so much traction in terms of kind of collaborating with other movements that have the same mentality. We have our slow food movements, we have our, you know, uh, the, um, the farm to table movements, all of those just kind of came really to uh, grew and kind of came to a really strong peak towards the end of the 20th, I say end of the 20th century now, like I'm talking about ancient history, it's terrifying. But anyway, end of the 20th century and into the 21st century, you know, that whole transition time there was, and there's a reason why this all kind of happened at that point, but natural wines kind of with a lot of that philosophical thought in terms of how can we get back to um, ideas, back to practices that are kind of more historic, more natural is the best way to do this. But this is obviously a philosophy that extends outside of wine and winemaking itself to a greater kind of picture of again lifestyle choices and just kind of decisions on how we live. Um, natural wine is a product so the thing is is that when you see natural wine it is on shelves it is something you can buy. Uh, it's a, in theory a product that is made with a certain philosophy through a specific process but again this is all kind of theoretical. It's hard to know it's hard to define and so while it is a product natural wine is not necessarily all of the things that we're going to talk about today depending on who's making it. Um, and then finally it's also important to know it is a movement. Um, this is it's hard to deny, <laughs> but the fact is the matter that we have so many, there are just devotees. Uh, there are people who only sell natural wine. There are people who only drink natural wine. There are bars that will only serve natural wine. And this huge, huge kind of movement towards all of these things together, encompassing, but all the, pro the process, the product and the philosophy together as this idea of, you know, natural wine, what that is, the movement towards being something, doing something different in a very, very specific and au natural way. I got it in there. Yeah, <laughs> totally. So um, when we talk about the history of natural wine, I mean, in reality, what we're talking about is a hearkening back to winemaking of yore. Basically, when there, before we had any kind of pesticides, uh, insecticides, herbicides, before there was really any kind of mechanism, before, you know, this is talking about when people made wine, when they first discovered how to make wine, that's about as natural as you can get, right? Now, when we talk about the modern movement of natural wine, roughly what we're talking about is kind of uh, dating back to Europe in the 1960s. This is a, specifically with a, a group of winemakers in Beaujolais and then later in the Loire Valley as well they were really kind of the young generation of that time, right? Um, you have this I idea philosophy that they wanted to make wines that use little to no sulfur dioxide. This was really the basis of their wines, like their grandfathers made. This is kind of this idea of like, we wanna go back to like our grandfathers made. It's interesting to know that like, when we talk about the modern movement, uh, the or the or um, this is around the same time that you have sort of the international organic movement, even before that is when that starts coming out with food and farming and all of that. Because when you think about the early 20th century, we're coming out of sort of this industrial revolution, this industrial age, when things like chemical herbicides and pesticides are becoming more prevalent, um, more available, and making life a lot easier for farmers to grow mass uh, quantities of whatever it is that they're growing or needing to make. Um, so this is really, oh, thank you, Dan. <laughs> Dan did that much better and faster than I did. I guess I was talking. Um, I appreciate that. <laughs> 
the um uh if for anyone who wants to know dan just put the the wine and the price and it's at high time so yes you can get it um the uh <laughs> this is uh this is an interesting thing that um all of these also kind of go back to a, a movement in the late 1800s in uh in germany that's called lebensreform which is basically the small reform and it's this same idea where we're late in the 1800s and this is a whole german culture idea of let's get back to uh you know natural farming let's get back to sort of like working the land being part of the land so all of these ideas are, are kind of um, build build upon one another and really what they are building against is the industrialization and sort of the modernization of what is available to farmers via new mechan mechanical and chemical um, processes uh, additives and procedures that are allowed to be used in commercial uh, production of things that we eat and drink right so that's really where it's coming from um, you know, and this is, of course, here. Yeah, so that original goal, going back to the, the Gang of Four in Beaujolais, uh, those guys, it was, I have right, Marcel Lapierre, Jean Foyard, uh, Charlie Tavernet, and Guy Breton. So these are the four uh, winemakers that were sort of noted for kind of getting together and forming their little gang and, and trying to create this movement that was using um, no sulfur dioxide, purity of wine, purity of, uh, of grape, terroir, and just process. Um, and what this was really in response to, in after building, of course, on this whole evolution of being against pesticides, insecticides, things like that, it was also against this kind of evolution in the wine industry that had started to take place um, of overly manipulating wine, of, of using um, additives and or um, uh, processing agents, we'll talk about both of those things later, to kind of make the process easier or to, to fix wine, if you will, instead of just letting it happen naturally. Um, there's this other process that's often used, or another term that's often used when we talk about natural wine called low or no intervention. This is really part of that natural wine philosophy. What does that mean? It means that you don't mess with the grapes. You let the grapes do their thing and you do as the winemaker as little as possible. You just kind of let it happen. Um, and while this is of course, again, this is not a new idea. This was a time that, you know, a lot of producers had the availability, had the uh, at their disposal opportunity to make these kind of processes easier through other methods. Um, and in particular in the late 20th century, why the sort of uh, the natural wine movement kind of came to a head is, is really the style of wine that was most popular. Um, so uh, just general wine trends, if we want to get super general uh, in the world, right? You had the 1980s in particular in the United States, this huge, huge movement towards white wines, right? So suddenly everyone wanted Chardonnay. Throughout the world, new plantings of white wines just cropping up everywhere, Chardonnay and Burgundy in Australia, people just replanting based on the replanting or regrafting, let us say their vineyards, um, to suit the fancies of what the consumer wanted. Um, this is, of course, also at this time, a lot of red wines were being touted um, and really praised for a style that was very, very heavy handed, very, very big, oaky, you know, the 200% oak that we talked about last week on some things. This idea of, of really, really manipulated wines in the sense that there was a lot of wine making going on. There was a lot of kind of uh, intervention with the wine to create a certain style, to recreate really the style that was getting the most praise, which led to kind of a, um, kind of a uh, conglomerization of wine in general, right? Everything started to taste the same. Um, when, you, when you use 100% new French oak on everything, it starts to taste the same. So there was sort of this, uh, this like flattening out, right, of individuality within wines to base it on a larger style that was getting a lot of praise at the time. So that, that this is what we're talking about at the end of the 20th century when suddenly a lot of like kind of, you want to think of it as sort of counterculture um, really, which is what it was doing to keep, uh, to kind of bring back this idea of we don't want that style of wine. We want to create wines that are au naturel, that are very, very uh, reminiscent of the grape, of the place, very, very much without any kind of um, procedural interventions or more specifically any kind of chemical interventions that could change or manipulate that in any way. So let's talk a little bit about the process of natural winemaking and what separates that from what we would call conventional winemaking. Again, none of this stuff regulated, but it's good to kind of get an idea of where they're coming from because in theory, if someone's saying, I make a natural wine, this is what they're doing. So in theory, 
Um, the, the process of making a natural wine is the idea that the wines should be produced by small scale independent growers. So we're not, we're talking about really going against big box. We're talking about going against major industry. Again, that counterculture of let's like, these are the farmers. These are the people who are toiling in the dirt. They get dirty, they make their wine. You know, this is all they care about. They don't care about money. This whole kind of idea of small scale uh, independent and, and very self self-sufficient um, natural winemakers is part of the process. Um, really, again, when we talk about natural wine, we're not just talking about the process of making wine, we're talking about the process of growing the grapes. So it extends into the vineyard. Uh, if you look, I have a book here, for those of you, when we talked about organic and biodynamic winemaking, Last year, it has been already, um, but this is that wonderful book, Wine Revolution by, Jan, uh, by Jane Anson. So this is a really great thing uh, where she goes through producers throughout the world, um, most specifically with organic and biodynamic viticulture, uh, but also she goes into natural winemakers as well. So she, this is a wonderful book that sort of explores the people who are producing these wines now that she sees as being sort of the best representations. Now, farming practices, when we talk about sustainable, organic, or biodynamic, um, when she talks about the natural winemaking in her book, she was using um, as her reference point because she says the same thing. There's no, there's no um, official definition or regulation. So she, she went to the Burgundians, she went to uh, the winemakers there and were like, what should I use as my criteria? Um, and they believe that organic and biodynamic farming is essential for that. Um, I'm including sustainable in there as well because of this. Um, when we're talking about farming practices, a lot of times you will have uh, winemakers who will use um, a majority of the practices, if not all of the practices of being certified organic or biodynamic, but without actually getting the certification. So there is this concept that there are, is, are a lot of winemakers who sort of do their best. Um, the idea of sustainability is really doing the best with what you have, but by natural winemaking standards, you are not supposed to be using any sort of chemical um, pesticides, herbicides, fertilizers, anything like that, which would be uh, mandatory for any organically or biodynamically certified farmer, right? So these are the things, that's why, that's why the organic and biodynamic certification are part of that, especially in terms of Jane Anson's definition, but knowing that there are definitely sustainable viticulturalists who will not use, um, you know, any sort of chemical pesticides or any, who practice that, as best they can um, is also kind of part of it. And so just the idea that really what we're talking about is purity in the vineyard, moving into purity in the winery as well um, to make the natural wine. Um, so then low to no intervention. And so you, you, I kind of talked about what that means, but it's also, uh, it's a lot about, you know, you can't have, <laughs> you can't use any helpers. Um, you know, and, and not all of that is additives, not all of that is putting stuff in the wine. Some of it is, is heating up your fermentation, right? Um, so fermentation is a process by which the yeast turns the sugars in the grapes into alcohol. Sometimes those yeasts get a little sensitive in terms of what kind of a temperature it is. If it's too cold, they're like, I don't want to make any alcohol. Meh. So then they'll just, you know, stop. Uh, <laughs> so a lot of times, or they could get too hot and they're like, woo, this is way too hot. Um, and then they'll stop. Uh, a stuck fermentation is kind of a, a winemaker's, you know, worst, <laughs> worst enemy. Um, now that being said, of course, uh, conceptually, the idea of, of heating up a room or anything like that would not be out of the realm of a natural winemaking process because really, you know, technically that is really natural. You're not using any sort of additional items in there, but true purists, right? They're saying you have to do nothing. You, um, you know, uh, the just the idea that like all open all open fermentation. One of the one of the main things is no yeast. You can't use any um, added yeast to help your fermentation. You have to work with whatever's naturally on the grapes. You know, uh, that's part of the additive situation. But all of the other kind of processes that go into it. The idea of gravity fed wineries. I'm sure you guys have all kind of heard of that too. Um, this that's part of uh, of that low to no intervention. The less mechanization that's involved in the process, right? The less electricity you have to use, the less kind of, you know, um, movement that needs to happen, the less kind of labor actually that really needs to happen. That's all part of the low intervention process. So it's not just about, you know, being hands off. It's about how much can you let nature literally do all of the work for you. 
Um, and again, no additives are allowed. And again, that includes uh, no added yeast to change uh, fermentation, no addition of lactic acid bacteria to help with malolactic fermentation if you're doing that. Uh, it also means um, uh, minimal to no uh, or no fining, filtering, or stabilizing agents as well. And this is really important in terms of how that translates into the bottle for natural wines. Um, so a couple of things that I just wanted to touch on uh, so that we can kind of all be on the same page with that is the idea of what we're talking about, right? So additives. Um, additives, when you think about additives, think about it the same way you think about food, right? What are the additives? Like red dye number five. Um, we, if, if it's in a food item, right? It's going to be on that label. It's, it's required by the FDA that that needs to be disclosed on the label. And there are hundreds of additives that can be put into wine, including totally uh, organic and normal ones like getting cultured yeasts to allow uh, to help with fermentations, um, using, uh, you know, chapelization even, you know, that's considered an additive when you're putting sugar into the wine and or into the must essentially to either extend your fermentation or um, increase the alcohol, the finished alcohol content of the wine. Um, acid, uh, a lot of times people use uh, tartaric acid. Acidification is also technically an additive. That is something that exists naturally in wine, but it would still be an additive and would be excluded from the process of natural winemaking. Now, in addition to all of the kind of natural additives that you have, you also have things like, um, you know, your well, technically powdered tannin, but you have a uh, mega purple, things to change the color of wine. You have uh, different chemical components that can alter the texture or um, illegal components. So for example, uh, like uh, oak essence that is often in many places considered illegal to use and that will still be used. Uh, but the difference um, with that is that uh, as we talked about with food, it has to go on the label. In wine, it does not. So the natural wine movement is also very much about the full transparency of the process. Um, if you're buying a natural wine, you should be able to go to your website, their website and you should be able to see like grape to bottle exactly what they do. They should have full transparency because that's really part of the philosophy of natural winemaking. They are against this kind of um, hidden, um, you know, uh, adulteration um, that happens that's really, really rampant in the wine industry because there is no accountability for, uh, for any kind of disclosure of this. So Nancy, you know, there's still no labeling standards for natural wine. Now, the only difference with that is when we had Brian on for, so Brian from the Organic Cellar, when he was on and we were talking about organic and, and biodynamic wines, he has made, he, he has said that he had applied to the FDA or to um, so the TTB to allow natural wine um, sort of regulations for some of the wines that were coming over from him. But as far as I, and he said he was the only one he's ever known who's done that. But still internationally, there is no international set of standards for what national wine, natural wine um, is, uh, what needs to go on the label. They can pretty much, the, the tricky part is, especially when we talk about that, uh, the farming practices to the winemaking practices, a bottle of wine can say natural wine, but maybe they're not using biodynamic practices. That doesn't, exclude them from being able to put natural wine on the label because there are no regulations for when that goes on the label still. I'm going to, I'm going to assume because there's no um, certification for natural wine, right? So whenever you have organic or biodynamic, you have to go through the certification process. You have to pay for that in order for that label to make it on the wine to identify the wine as such for all consumers to know because the concepts of organic and biodynamic are very clearly defined and for people who are consumers and interested in that they can identify that and readily understand what that means via the uh, certification but uh, there is nothing like that for natural wine still that will come it will have to with uh, the size of the movement but it's just a matter of who's going to put it together um, so processing aids are slightly different. They're not additives, they are actual, but they are added to must or wine for different reasons, usually to um, bind with or react with certain elements that are in wine and then essentially remove them. So these are your fining agents. These are your filtration agents. These are uh, some things to like remove proteins, um, remove unstable components in wine. Uh, that will eventually, if they were to be left in the bottle, could potentially turn that bottle bad after the wine has been bottled and, and put on the shelf. Um, I mean, this is this is really part of the what we what I'm going to talk about next, which is the stabilization process. But these different processing aids are are frowned upon and also not used by natural winemakers. Uh, in this particular in the particular case of um, processing aids. 
There are some instances where they do have to be disclosed on the label because when I talk about finding agents, there are uh, allergens uh, and also um, sometimes some some countries, it's not everywhere, but uh, sometimes there are things like not as not as common anymore, but fish bladder, ox blood, uh, animal materials that are used as finding agents, so that they some countries require that to go on the label, so that vegans and or vegetarians can be made aware of that, um, and or if there's any sort of allergies to those kinds of um, items, then that would be uh, required by the country. But again, that varies based on country. So Rachel's asking, is there a difference between calling something organic versus natural? Yes, there is. When you're talking about wine, uh, and you use the term organic. What you are referring to is the organic viticultural practices that have been certified uh, to be used by that winery or that wine that grade those growers. Um, so organic, I mean, <laughs> if you want to get really kind of broad about it, I mean, we throw we can throw around the word organic all the time too. Like this is so organic, man, just like that, like everyone does, right? Um, but this idea that organic means sort of, uh, you know, um, nebulous. Uh, the the actual definition of organic. Uh, as a word obviously has many interpretations. When we're talking about wine, if it says organic on the label, then it has to be um, certified uh, via either Demeter or one of the other agents, the EcoCert, um, the, uh, or um, not Demeter, Demeter is the, anyway, but it has to be, sorry, it has to be certified through the institution that certifies for organic wines for it to be called that. And it does mean that the farming practices are required to use organic practices. They have to be checked. Um, you know, they have to re-up their certification every year to be consistent with their practices. Um, in addition to that too, uh, you know, um, part of the natural wine movement um, with their, their intention of not using uh, sulfur dioxide, which is a naturally occurring compound in wine. Um, it is allowed, sulfur dioxide is, is, is allowed to be used in organic winemaking and they don't agree with that. So there's an interesting sort of dichotomy there. Um, natural, as I'm, as I'm mentioning, is like natural, there is no uh, standard definition for natural. So that's kind of what we're talking about today is how like you can say organic and it means something very specific. You can say natural and it means a certain idea but without the actual regulations in place, there's really no way to hold a wine accountable to being natural, right? So um, the uh, last thing I just wanna talk about really quickly is this idea of stabilization. So um, we're talking about clarification, right? Or when we talk about fining and filtration, these are all processes that are used to help stabilize the wine. A stable wine is, uh, is basically what we're used to drinking. Um, it, it's clear. It's usually uh, been any sort of, um, you know, residual yeast cells or residual kind of uh, elements or molecules are kind of slightly uh, filtered out of there. Clarification can happen naturally. The most natural way to clarify wine is to leave it in a barrel or in a bottle and let everything sink down to the bottom. And this can take months and months and years and years even, but ultimately that is, uh, that is a natural process of clarification and then just um, you say, oh, Anne is saying friends just issued a definition, but you haven't read it yet uh, for natural wine, have they? Okay, um, I can't wait to read it. <laughs> I would love to see that, but no rules in the US yet. Yeah, I, I, thank you, Anne. I will totally look that up. Um, the, uh, the idea of stabilization though is essentially that wine, um, you'd think because there's alcohol in it that it's, it's once it goes into the bottle, it's gonna be fine and it won't harm you. Wine can't, wine can't turn bad and, and, and hurt you, but it can turn off, right? It can, uh, it can contain microbes, for example, bacterial microbes that can essentially uh, change the composition of the wine. Uh, Acetobacter, for example, will turn it into vinegar. So if there is latent bacteria in the wine when it's bottled, because it has not been stabilized, fined, filtered, or clarified, then you have the potential of a, of a, of, of a wine that, yes, as Nancy's saying, it can't hurt you, but it can offend you. <laughs> I like that. Um, so additionally to, you know, there's, there's things like tartrate st stabilization, which is that process of tartrates form naturally again in the wine. There's those little wine diamonds, right? That will, you'll see sometimes in white wine um, that can come out if a wine has been, um, cooled very, a white wine, for example, has been cooled uh, down very, very cold and then warmed up again and then cooled again. And this process can sort of uh, basically make, the, make these tartrate crystals um, precipitate out of solution and just sink down to the bottom of the bottle. There's no harm in that, 
but consumers don't like them. Consumers think that potentially they might be drinking glass. They're like, is there broken glass in here? Um, and you know, these are all more just for aesthetic um, a lot of times than they are functional. Um, and this is again, something where natural wine, they're like, let's keep those in. Let's keep it cloudy and hazy. Let's keep those tartrate crystals in because that's natural. And it's, um, in addition to that though, when you take away, and sulfur dioxide, I need to point out, while also being a natural element, is a very, very natural, in very, very small doses, can really do dramatic, um, have dramatic benefits to stabilizing wine, especially when it's getting shipped across, uh, shipped anywhere across a distance. Because SO2 has the unique property ability of being able to kind of combine naturally with kind of um, rogue elements in the wine that could potentially cause spoilage over the course of that time. And just a little bit of SO2 is needed, not a lot, but ultimately SO2 is one of those things that has to be disclosed on labels for wine. And it's, in, it's disclosed on almost every single wine label you will ever read, because again, it occurs naturally in wine already. What the natural wine movement is against is the overuse of it, which has become, which had become prolific because there are so many different things that I can do in terms of being a preservative, an antimicrobial, um, a stabilizer that it was being used too heavy handed. Um, but no use of SO2 at all, no use of any of these other kind of processing agents or uh, other, other kind of um, mechanisms or procedures can create an inherently unstable wine, which is why it's not uncommon to find natural wines being extremely variable bottle to bottle. Because, and, and sometimes, you know, having a much higher rate of offensiveness, as, as Nancy would put it, than you might expect from a normal, a normal uh, conventionally made wine. So some of the most typical natural wines that you will see, I just want to go over a few of the definitions right here. So Petit Natural is, uh, is often referred to as Pet Nat. Um, this has been like the darling of the natural wine movement, right? Everyone's like, I'm going to give you some Pet Nat. Um, and these can be wonderful, amazing wines. They can also be extremely offensive, uh, depending on what your taste and your style is, right? But what it is legitimately is really um, the oldest form of making uh, sparkling wine. Basically, it's how sparkling wine happened. The method ancestral is the French term for it. Um, and method ancestral is really this process of a single long fermentation um, that ultimately captures CO2 in the wine in the form of bubbles. This happened because back in the day, way, way, way back in the day, the grandfathers of the grandfathers, you know, they would make wine. Um, and before the wine was finished fermenting, they might have thought it was done fermenta fermentationing. Um, but then they would close the barrels and put the barrels away for the winter. Um, and because it was so cold, the yeast that was still in there um, decided to stop and didn't ferment all of the sugar into alcohol and still had CO2 to release. So these sealed barrels or these sealed vessels would be in the cellars. And then in the springtime, the cellar would warm up just enough to get the yeast going again. And the fermentation would kick in again. Same fermentation, just a big long winter pause. So that's the difference between method ancestral and any other kind of sparkling wine that we're used to, one long single fermentation as opposed to two separate fermentations that are intentional. Lael, that's exactly it. So champagne is a different process. It is two fermentations as opposed to one fermentation that takes place over a long period of time with a pause in the middle. It sounds like it should be the same thing, but here is the difference. When you have fermentation um, that happens this one long process, what that also means is that originally those yeast cells that were captured in the barrel that then fermented the residual sugar into alcohol, released CO2 bubbles that were then dissolved into the wine, those yeast cells would die and sink down to the bottom of the barrel. And ultimately you would have this cloudy wine. This could happen in the bottle too, if they bottled it before they thought it was uh, done fermenting as well. And that's technically what you see with Petit Lant Naturel. They don't filter out those extra yeast cells because it's all one long fermentation. And the, the uh, amount of sparkle is much less. So champagne, for example, has usually six atmospheres of pressure in the bottle, whereas Petit Lant Naturel is going to be much, much um, more frisante, more of the three atmospheres or below. So that you can close it, for example, like mine, this isn't a Petit Lant Naturel, but a lot of pet nuts are closed with this. 
just a uh, I bottle cap. I know. Can you see it? <laughs> Probably not. So um, the bottle cap is a really typical, which is actually what's used to close the champagne bottles. But champagne, the wine that's initially fermented is fermented all the way dry. Then the wine is put into the bottle. They add sugar and yeast, close the bottle. And then thus it is a completely separate second fermentation. I hope that makes sense, Leo. Let me know if it doesn't. But um, again, because Petillant Naturel is this method ancestral version, you will tend to see uh, lower alcohol a lot of times too. Um, traditionally a little cloudy again because of the residual yeast and sometimes even a little bit of residual sugar still because eventually, you know, not even all of the sugar gets fermented. Um, so this is your sort of style. Now these can come off um, again, very, very appealing. One of the first uh, AOCs that was really defined for this style of making was in uh, mont louis loire so uh, they make a beautiful, and if anyone, I mean, it's not officially, because he does filter it, so it's not officially, I think, considered a natural wine, but Jackie Blow, triple zero, amazing, beautiful, beautiful um, Petillon uh, Chenin Blanc uh, that does uh, pretty much is all natural winemaking with just the, the uh, condition that they do filter out the yeast cells to create a clear, a clear product at the end but very low intervention. And in that area, there's a lot of this style of wine that was defined literally by AOC, uh, one of the first ones in the modern era to have that. Now, whole cluster fermentation, I threw this in here as well, because it does come up quite a bit, especially when we're talking about natural wine. Um, it's the idea, of course, of using whole bunches of red grapes during fermentation, so not destemming them. Um, this is considered sort of a very natural, traditional way of making red wine because it, they used to do that before they had crushers and destemmers, those big machines that you could throw the grapes in, would remove the stems, and then ultimately you could just throw those stems away and not use them. Um, the difference, of course, is that there's a few things. One, um, when you have whole clusters and whole berries, there's a different kind of fermentation that starts, which is called carbonic maceration. It is an intracellular fermentation that happens inside the closed berry that does not involve any yeast but alcohol begins to be created through this carbonic maceration. Um, and if you're using any, any part of whole cluster, if you're using partial whole cluster, all whole cluster, uh, you will get some of this effect. It tends to create sort of this um, very, very fruity, very fresh kind of flavor and aroma in the wine uh, as a result. So uh, a lot of producers who are not intentionally making natural wine use whole cluster because they like the way that it kind of affects and or um, adds to different layers within the complexity of their wine. Now, in addition to that, you also have the inclusion of the stems and uh, that includes additional tannin. So those uh, tannins will also then be extracted into the wine. Now, this is why you tend to see whole cluster. You hear it a lot more with uh, lighter skinned varietals like uh, Gamay, like Pinot Noir, because those, those grapes naturally have a lower level of tannin in them. So a little bit of extra tannin from the stems can be a benefit. For grapes that are already high in tannin level, like a Cabernet Sauvignon, for example, you're not gonna tend to see as much whole cluster because it can then kind of overwhelm with the additional tannin. You're also having to deal with the fact that you need to make sure those stems are ripe. So then it means when you're picking those grapes, you not only have to make sure that those grapes are perfectly ripe, you have to make sure all the way down to where you're cutting off of that vine that those stems are equally as ripe as the grapes, which may or may not be depending. So it adds that element of challenge with that. But now what is interesting, of course, by um, low intervention in natural winemakers is that tannins are, of course, also a natural antioxidant and kind of a natural preservative. So it helps to naturally stabilize wines. Um, if you're making a natural wine, having a little bit more tannin in those wines through the use of stem inclusion can help to provide a little bit of extra stability if you're not using any other form of um, SO2 or filtration or um, fining. Um, so an orange wine, which is what I'm drinking right now. So orange wine is an ancient, ancient process uh, where there, you make white wine essentially by fermenting white grapes on their skins. So essentially making white wine like red wine. Again, we are looking at this, um, this interesting style of wine that has gained a lot of popularity recently, although it is one of the oldest forms of winemaking that is out there. Um, white, these orange wines will have tannins in them as well because of that prolonged exposure and fermentation on the skins. Um, 
And that also results in this deeper color. There is a difference between orange wine, between fermenting white grapes on the skin and just um, macerating uh, the grapes on the skins. A lot of producers will allow the, they'll crush the white grapes and before fermentation begins, essentially they'll do a cold soak of the must on the white grape skins before they press that wine and then ferment it separately. Now that is also an option that can add complexity, a little bit of an aroma layer to the wines, a little bit of maybe phenolic to the wine, but by actually fermenting on the skins, you're getting a much, much deeper, more intense uh, experience of that tannin integration into a white wine, which is very, very atypical for white wines, as we kind of know. But what that does do, again, because those tannins are now present in the wine, it is helping to kind of stabilize that wine, potentially give it longer shelf life and or um, stability over passage of distance, for example, right? So that can help also reduce that need for SO2 as a preservative and uh, to make sure that that wine, when you open the bottle, uh, it tastes inoffensive, hopefully. That being said, a lot of people don't like the flavor of orange wine and want to find it offensive regardless. <laughs> but um, uh, that's, oh, that's not the right one, sorry. But um, but yeah, so that's orange wine right there. We have, uh, the, that's sort of the typical, um, uh, that's what orange wine is. And that's why it's part of the natural wine movement. Um, what I did want to share is that this, this again sort of came to light um, uh, more recently uh, in Friuli, the Friuli area of Italy, uh, were sort of regenerated a lot um, by, uh, um, by uh, Yosko, oh my goodness, I'm blanking on his name, someone's got it for me. Um, but there's a whole, uh, a whole producer's Grobner, Josko Grobner, um, in Friuli, Italy, is sort of the father where he started in the 1980s, essentially really reinvesting in this idea of only making what he calls amber wine, um, and uh, then also uh, his red wines in this very traditional method. So Becky's asking me, what is SO2? So SO2 is sulfur dioxide, and SO2 is um, essentially, it's an organic component that is found in wine in a lot of natural food products in uh, nature, but it's also typically in winemaking used as an additive to do a few different things to prevent the grapes from oxidizing, to prevent the must from oxidizing, to kill off some bacteria, um, and to sort of act again as a preservative for the wine as it's bottled and then and processed. So um, the, the trouble with SO2 is that it had become and has become um, a little too heavily relied on I would say by a lot of winemakers in order to, to fix wines um, and or uh, change sort of the process. Uh, so natural winemakers believe that using no or uh, very, very little SO2 is the more um, natural way to make wine. So when you're buying natural wine and you're looking for the shelf, you do have to be aware that, again, there's no regulation. So it's going to be up to you to kind of do your due diligence with either who's ever selling you the wine or who's recommending it, that they know that this producer is authentically um, producing natural wine. Uh, you know, that's where this book will come in handy because if you wanna try some from different areas of the world, this is a great way to identify producers. Um, because it's really, really all about producers because when we talk about this being a philosophy, you have to be into the philosophy. So most natural wine is actually really meant to be drunk useful. Again, when we're talking about using no preservatives, we're not really talking about getting a natural wine to put on your shelf and drink 10 years from now. So do enjoy it now. That being said, there are definitely some that probably can age, but uh, the majority of them are really meant to sort of be drunk as you, as you get them. Um, bottle to bottle variation, as I mentioned, because of this sort of irregularity um, and because of the natural uh, irregularity that happens in bottles. You already have like at least one bottle in every three cases is tasting a little bit different, but even, even conventionally made wines, each bottle can taste different on a different day. It's all very, very fascinating. But, um, you know, so the, it's to be expected sometimes that you'll have a wider variation within a single case. Um, and that can be part of the fun too. Uh, so it's really important to kind of be, be ready and flexible for that as you're buying natural wine. And then, you know, again, it may take some trial and error to find the ones that you really like because there are so many different styles and sort of so many different expressions. Um, but you know, hang in there and eventually you're going to find something for me. Uh, I mean, like I really, I tend to like sour things. I tend to like sour fruit flavors, sour, sour beers, like kind of a goose thing. So for me, there's a lot of this, um, 
wonderful uh i this kind of tannin this kind of tartness a little bit of bitterness that kind of that suits me well um that doesn't suit everyone's palate but uh there's all sorts of different kinds of natural wines that people can find in a wide range a wide range of flavor styles sparkling semi-sparkling amanda's asking if i've been to semi-tropic wine in costa mesa i haven't yet i've been seeing them and i wasn't sure if they had opened it's been a while but yes they are doing all natural wines um super interesting that they're called semi-tropic but uh yeah their whole philosophy is all natural wines there so if you want to go they're going to be great people to kind of give you descriptions. I think what's really helpful is to have someone say, this is a natural wine, but this is what it tastes like. <laughs> so that when you open it, you're not like, this tastes like a sour fruit punch in my gut, or this tastes like a syrupy sweet. I'm, I'm making both of them sound bad, but you know, you kind of get the idea. <laughs> so, um, Essentially, so that's it, you guys. That is sort of the topic about natural wine. I hope it made you less confused than more confused. Um, so <laughs> does anyone have any questions or thoughts, comments, concerns? Anything you want to share? Anyone want to show me more wine that they're drinking? Um, I think that, I mean, and it's, it's a funny thing just to go back to this idea that there's a lot of people out there who just make wines. Um, Oh, Kimberly is giving a good one. Uh, Kim, field recordings, field recordings, great place. Dry hop pet nap, nice, awesome. Um, yeah, if anyone has a favorite that they know and love, put it in that chat box. I'm gonna leave it open for two more minutes. Everyone put that in there. <laughs> and then I'll send them out um, with the email tomorrow for any recommendations that came up during class. Um, oh yeah, the Kabai, the Kabai, Anne, absolutely. That was, oh, I love that wine. I just used it recently. Um, a beautiful, beautiful Slovenian wine. Again, or like with that kind of orange wine um, aspect, the, the skin contact, the additional kind of wonderful wines. Um, but yeah, it's it's fun. It's a fun exploration, and I think that you know, um, it's definitely another thing to consider. In the past ten years or so, there have been wild improvements also in the quality <laughs> that are coming to market. So there's a little bit more consistency. People, winemakers are natural winemakers are becoming a little bit more. I'm confident and a little bit um, more practiced in their winemaking to kind of create a little bit more. Um, uh, yes, Nancy is not all not all natural wines are orange wines. That is very much true. <laughs> but this idea that um, natural wines in general, with that kind of variability that comes through, um, the idea that you have a lot of. Um, I totally lost my train of thought. Sorry. <laughs> I'm talking too much. I'm, I'm already 22 minutes over. Okay, I'm gonna let you all go. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Have a wonderful month, you guys. Join me next week. I start my class on California next Thursday. Join me and I'll see you all later. Lone Madrone, yes, Lone Madrone, beautiful. Okay, cheers everyone. Have a great night, bye.